Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean Rehag. I'm the director of the Center for Refugee Studies at York University, and I'm also a, a faculty member at uh, Osgoode Hall Law School. I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, today's uh, CRS uh, seminar uh, live uh, from uh, my office. It's nice to be back on campus after uh, uh, several weeks of uh, disruption. Uh, so I'm delighted uh, today uh, to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Jay uh, Ramasubramanyam. Uh, Jay is uh, a, a new uh, faculty member uh, here at uh, York University. Uh, he uh, teaches in the Law and Society uh, program. Uh, he uh, comes uh, to York uh, with an LLM in international human rights uh, from uh, Birmingham City uh, University. Uh, he also holds uh, a PhD from the Department of Law and Legal Studies and the Institute of uh, Political Economy at uh, Carleton uh, University. Uh, he's going to be speaking to us uh, today uh, about uh, the post-colonial paradox of the refugee migrant binary uh, in the subcontinent, um, an area that he has uh, quite a bit of, uh, of expertise uh, in. So um, Jay, I am very pleased that you've uh, joined us uh, here today, and I'm even more pleased that you've uh, joined us at uh, York University. It's uh, particularly, um, uh, I particularly like having um, additional colleagues who uh, work at the intersection of migration uh, and uh, law. Uh, we haven't yet had a chance to uh, actually uh, meet uh, in uh, person, uh, but I did I want to formally uh, welcome you to York and welcome you to uh, CRS. Um, so uh, we'll hear from you uh, and uh, then we'll have some time uh, for a Q&A. So over to you, Jay. Thank you so much, uh, Sean, for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to speak on uh, this particular topic uh, that I have been thinking about for a little while. Um, when we do talk about the refugee migrant labels, my question here is whether they account for the complexity of subcontinental colonial histories. So what I'm gonna to speak today is uh, more of a historicizing um, of the refugee migrant binary uh, concerning uh, the subcontinent. I'll also try to uh, talk a little bit about some of the post-colonial uh, cartographic divisions that developed um, as a result of the sudden withdrawal of the British um, in 1947. And also think about how drivers of migration in the region are subjectively different um, as opposed to the European experience. So by, by pointing to the disconnect that currently uh, exists between Eurocentric conceptual categories and the lived experiences of those on the move in the Indian subcontinent, I argue that the refugee migrant binary needs to be reimagined and should also include subcontinental perspectives that have been historically marginalized. So in 2016, the UNHCR put up a story, um, refugee or migrant, which is right. And this, is, this was at the peak of some of the displacements that were occurring, uh, especially from the Middle East, uh, heading towards Western Europe. And the refugee migrant dichotomy has come to occupy a very dominant role uh, while discussing displacement in general. So the 2016 story um, said that uh, refugees are persons fleeing armed conflict or persecution, and migrants choose to move not because of a direct threat of persecution or death, but mainly to improve their lives. To me, it appeared as a very simplistic categorization of a refugee and uh, migrants. So what I argue is that characterizing, characterizations like these tend to um, limit um, the complexity of circumstances of displacement in non-European contexts specifically. Now, critical perspectives on the applicability of these labels are not very new, but subcontinental perspectives remain very limited uh, in literature. And these labels were created to define the lived condition of an individual on the move. So discussions on the genesis of these labels will reveal 
that experiences of displacement in the Western world pushed for their universal application without considering some of the radically different circumstances in the global South, more specifically in the subcontinent. What I want to also point out is that with a caveat, that when I talk about the subcontinent, I specifically talk about India and Pakistan in this particular case. And of course, you know, South Asia is a very complex region um, that would require a separate discussion. The movements um, in the rest of South Asia requires a separate um, workshop or a seminar of its own. But today I'm going to limit my discussions just to India and Pakistan because of the history, uh, which I will talk about a little bit more. So literature, literature on the refugee migrant binary has critiqued the, the supposedly uh, universal labels as being quite ambiguous. And um, for scholars like Zetter, uh, for instance, argues that more than the definitional issue, the dichotomous nature of these labels tend to present challenges on how such categorizations are recognized by states and institutions and what forms of protection are provided to each group of people. However, it is also critical to note that there is a fair bit of fragility uh, of the one dimensional nature of these labels. And these are exposed when post-colonial subjectivities are brought into consideration. The imprecision and fragility uh, in labeling are further uh, reinforced by the normative nature of the refugee migrant binary. Constructions of refugeehood that manifest in extending protection to those who are displaced are also rooted in, in Western assumption of what a refugee is, as Kiriakides argues. Now, such assumptions uh, have led to the implementation of an exclusionary refugee protection instrument that tends to invalidate the concerns of those uh, displaced from and within the global south and reinforces a normative understanding of displacement. It is also equally significant uh, to highlight that uh, the lacunae did not develop in a vacuum. So just a little bit of history uh, here. Um, and this is, of course, not something um, of a very common connection that people would make. Coloniality and hierarchical ordering of the world's populations is not as innocuous as it seems with respect to uh, some of these displacements and the way it is being considered. Uh, because they undergird some of the contemporary applications of refugee migrant labels. The idea of human is rooted in European modernity and was always designated based on specific descriptors. And this allowed for the brutalization of racialized bodies through slavery and indentured servitude. As a result, universal human equality uh, completely uh, continues to be quite aspirational purely because human rights norms are exclusionary and did not originally apply uh, to everybody. This process of dehumanization also reproduced itself in colonial experiences after the 19th century in Asia and Africa, and the figure of the colonized did not qualify for the right of the man and of the citizen. So the characterization of the human or person is centered around uh, European colonial activities and philosophies, thereby giving rise to the notion that this is not a universal concept, but is instead contingent on racial othering of colonized peoples of the world. In addition to characterizing third world peoples in a subordinate uh, status, um, categorizing groups of people in need of protection has also been conceptualized, institutionalized and predicated on the interests of Europeans and European states. Now this preoccupation with European disenfranchisement leads to yet another critique. That is the Eurocentrism that is endemic in international cooperation, wherein the narrative of the international did not include the global South. So very little of the history and uh, evolution of the refugee migrant labels, um, includes perspectives from formerly colonized states. Frameworks that were developed in response to what had happened um, after the Second World War sets an ostensibly universal standard for migrant protection. However, not all of those 
who had been disenfranchised had access to such protection. So a metric that Eurocentrism tends to use to conceptualize these labels is based on the inherent idea that they are designed to be European solutions to European problems. This tends to then place displacement in the global south outside the purview um, of these frameworks. Therefore, the institutionalization of such labels during a time when uh, colonialism was in its full force belies its ability to present itself as a truly universal framework. And it calls for a reconsideration of its applicability in the subcontinent. Now, one of the things to remember is that a lot of these elements was not um, without resistance. Of course, refugee movements in, uh, in South Asia uh, is a very complex topic that I engaged with in my doctoral uh, work. Um, but for today, I want to point out that refugee movements within South Asia after the partition of India in 1947 resulted from both the direct involvement of Western colonial powers who were also among the, the founding members of the international refugee regime. And of course, this is also because of the sudden withdrawal of the British from the subcontinent that was followed by the creation of new international borders in the subcontinent, which resulted in a lot of internal strife. Now, the creation of arbitrary international borders as a part of the partition of India was also a manifestation of the hierarchical ordering of populations that I spoke about just a, a few seconds ago. And this is also inherent in the colonial enterprise. Now this served as a, um, as a foundation uh, to understand what was going on in India and Pakistan after the, um, after the end of formal colonialism. Now this left um, India with the remnants of oppression and ethno-religious divisions. And as scholars like Zamindar uh, articulate, it was through the making of refugees as a governmental category through refugee rehabilitation as a tool of planning that new nations and borders between them were made and people including families were divided. So after the end, the formal end to colonialism in South Asia, India and Pakistan uh, attempted to constructively interact uh, with the international community to establish a robust legally binding uh, protection framework for refugees. Uh, both states arrived at the United Nations with a lot of enthusiasm and also on the heels of widespread violence and displacement resulting from the partition of India in 1947. Now the movement in the subcontinent amid the partition was not a voluntary exodus. It was a thoughtless bureaucratic mode of control that created categories of disenfranchised peoples whereby Muslims boarded trains in Delhi bound for Pakistan and Hindus and Sikhs from Pakistan to India, not to migrate, but in search for refuge. Now, India and Pakistan during this time vociferously voiced their demands to expand the refugee definition to include colonized people uh, within its rubric. And when some of these requests and demands were denied, by the time the final stages of the formalization process of the convention had begun, both India and Pakistan had withdrawn their representation. And their withdrawal was not for the lack of active resistance. It was instead a response to the emerging contours of the refugee regime that remained overwhelmingly Eurocentric in their approach and failed to account for new categories of dis disenfranchised peoples on either side of the newly created international border. <clears throat> So overlooking events like the partition of India and the displacements that followed tends to create a disjuncture between the past and contemporary policy prescriptions. Therefore, a universal label of uh, a refugee or migrant is very heavily limiting in the region because it fails to challenge the stereotypical approaches to refugeehood and account for post-colonial subjectivities that were inherent uh, in subcontinental displacement. 
Conventional application of these labels has constructed a profile of a victim based on the notion that non-Western objects are devoid of context or sociocultural history and waits to be rescued by the benevolent West, as Kyriakides argues. Given the centrality of these absent discourses um, that would adequately accommodate the colonial legacies associated with the development of these labels, it is critical to examine the ambiguity associated with them. Now, critically evaluating uh, these labels uh, from the perspective of the Indian subcontinent tends to lay bare uh, what Chimney um, identifies as the myth of difference. Um, within um, the myth of difference idea, the nature and character of refugee flows in the third world were radically different from the flows in Europe since uh, the end of the First World War. Now, this manifested in an image of a normal refugee who could be identified as white, as male, anti-communist, which clashed sharply with individuals fleeing the third world. So in addition to challenging some of the myopic understandings of refugeehood, examining the applicability of these labels from the standpoint of the global South could serve to denaturalize the dominant understandings of the refugee category as essentialist and universal. So in order to overcome some of these conceptual difficulties in establishing a normative meaning uh, to a label which is malleable and dynamic as a refugee, which is contingent upon notions of persecution and sovereignty about which there is very little consensus, South Asian states chose to regard displacement as a matter between, um, between states in the region. And in doing so, they asserted, uh, they reasserted their resistance to hegemonic norms of international protection, but also developed unique legal and operational concepts of uh, refugeehood, which allowed for people to be able to uh, seek asylum or seek some kind of sanctuary and escape ethno-religious violence. So within this context, um, Pakistan, for instance, included Muhajir, uh, or a refugee as a category within its 1951 census. Now, Muhajirs are, um, were those people who had moved to Pakistan as a result of the partition or fear of disturbances connected their way. Now, the term Muhajir has a rich and powerful pedigree in Islamic jurisprudence and state practice. And as Rahman uh, shows, it was generally used to identify Muslim refugees uh, who came to settle in the urban areas of the Sindh province, uh, which was bordering India. Now, similarly, India and Pakistan have also signed the 1950 uh, Nehru Liaquat uh, Pact, whereby the two governments agreed uh, to protect people who had been displaced as a result of violence along religious lines. The pact also guaranteed minorities complete equality of citizenship, irrespective of religion, a full sense of security in respect of life, culture, property and personal honor, uh, freedom of movement within each country and freedom of occupation, speech and worship. So it was for those times, given that there was still a lot of tension with respect to post-colonial nation building, this was considered to be a relatively progressive act uh, for those days for both India and Pakistan. Now, this brings us to some contemporary implications. Of course, you know, I have fast forwarded, to, fast forwarded through a lot of history, um, I mean, in the interest of time, but what is very important for me to also highlight the fact that there are contemporary implications to some of these, um, some of these historical elements. Now, one thing that can be established uh, is that the conventional nature of the refugee migrant label tends to uh, obfuscate the causes of displacement in the subcontinent, uh, given that colonial interventions were never conceptualized uh, in legal and policy provisions designed to protect refugees and migrants. Now, this constrained approach of these labels tends to homogenize and oversimplify the experiences of people in the subcontinent. Those states in the subcontinent have not forsaken their responsibility towards persons of concern. Their adherence to core objectives of humanitarian uh, response have been reshaped over a period of time, uh, 
to adapt to the protection needs of different groups of people on the move within the region. Now, the policy and legal categories may appear fixed, um, but they are in fact constantly subject to challenge across different national and regional contexts. And characterizing, um, so this is particularly noteworthy uh, in the subcontinent uh, that has had to contend with a lot of challenges associated with post-colonial nation building and identity making uh, along with frequent events of displacement throughout these decades. So conventional notions of these labels may appear static, but these categories are in a constant state of change and renegotiation and redefinition. So the refugee migrant categorization uh, is quite powerful, uh, given that the discretion to label someone as a refugee or as a migrant has remained within the exclusive domain of European states, which was evident from how partition-induced displacement was characterized during the formalization process of the convention. Labeling is a deeply uh, powerful political process, one by which uh, political agendas are established. They also serve to position people as objects of policy in a particular way. So by characterizing the subcontinent's movements uh, in 1947 as a seamless exchange of populations, the drafters consciously ensured that those who were displaced, dispossessed, and disenfranchised were not entitled to international protection. In fact, the marginalization of the Indian subcontinent amid uh, the scale of partition displacement was also made very clear uh, during a private conversation uh, the US delegate Philip Burnett had with the Pakistani delegate, Mr. Bokhari. Burnett is known to have explained that the extension of material aid uh, to the partition refugees under the mandate of the High Commissioner's Office would not be regarded favorably by the US since the problem was so enormous. Secondly, while conceptualizing the label of a refugee, the drafters of the 1951 convention failed to capture colonial violence and colonial inheritance of cartographic divisions uh, within persecutory factors. Now this has manifested into myopic definitions of displacement and migration and obscurely Eurocentric principles were embedded within international frameworks such as the Refugee Convention. Such anomalies have obviously had a particularly pernicious contemporary impact uh, in India. For instance, in August 2017, the government of India directed authorities to identify, quote, illegal immigrants, uh, including Rohingya refugees, and commence deportation procedures. Now, this decision has emerged in light of India's anti-Muslim sentiments and attempts to redefine citizenship along ethno-religious lines. However, historicizing this policy move reveals that the refugee label is more readily afforded to non-Muslims in India due to the forced ideological linkage between religion and territory that has manifested after the partition. So contemporary policies in the subcontinent can be linked to the partition that was defined by incomprehensible violence and colossal displacements in these new post-colonial states. Though India has been generous in the past uh, by hosting refugees, in recent years, there has been a change in tone with rapid deportations of many refugees, specifically Rohingya. This policy decision, as I mentioned, has emerged in light of India's anti-Muslim sentiments, um, but the current government has also been very selective about who deserves protection. During this time, the absence of a national refugee law has become more of an issue. Uh, given that draconian executive action is undertaken by the ruling government, which has hurt several groups of refugees like the Rohingya. And given the uninviting and ambiguous legal and policy environment that refugees are currently faced in, the prospect of even more contemporary instruments like the Global Compact on Refugees initially provided some cause for hope, but it does not provide any new avenues for better access to protection uh, purely because the GCR does a very poor job of discussing the right to asylum and access to protection, given the misplaced emphasis laid on mitigating the pressures on host states. At a time when uh, religious tensions in India are quite high, there is a need for more flexible characterization of refugeehood. India's 
current attitude towards refugee protection belies its past uh, practice, but this is a manifestation of a narrow form of nationalism that is deeply tied to a post-colonial geopolitical space that continues to be in a state of flux, as Chimney argues. Chimney also says that this needs to be actively revisited in a global age where the refugee should be seen as an agent of progressive democratic and just global order. So as the discussions demonstrate, the binary nature of refugee migrant label lays bare the rigidity associated with them and also the lack of inclusivity in its application. The subcontinent's disillusionment has not only resulted in the development of a different conceptualization of migration, but has also been um, able to develop a different conceptualization by establishing ad hoc norms of protection. While domestic policymaking in the subcontinent may lack the nuance and is heavily influenced by ethno-nationalist political movements, it is critical to contextualize these contemporary exclusionary policies of migrant and refugee protection within the history of nation building and identity forming in the region. Colonial influences have certainly reshaped nationalist agenda over a period of uh, the last few decades, but these historical gaps do not justify draconian policies against specific religious groups of migrants and refugees. However, the blurring of these categories is the result of the deeply entrenched inequities in the narrative of the refugee migrant binary. Moreover, the regional practice is informed by the historical and cultural genealogy that is quite different from the European context and undergirds ostensibly universal characterizations of displacement. As scholars like Hamlin argue, attention to the development of alternate refugee concepts and their application to contemporary migrations in the global south helps to illustrate the ways in which the strict nature of the migrant refugee binary emerges as a global north construct. As the analysis, a very brief analysis on post-colonial resistance demonstrated, states in the subcontinent were forced to adopt a myopic definition that did not represent their experiences. However, subcontinental historiographies are critical in understanding the constraints associated with these labels. Organizations like UNHCR have adopted their discursive and productive power in understanding refugeehood that has created and enforced new realities through the use of knowledge, discourse, and claims to legitimacy. Though this may have functioned to advance progressive interpretations of international refugee law, it has also served to constrain refugee rights in many cases and have also failed to account for post-colonial subjectivities of the subcontinent. Such narratives also overlook the fact that global South states have done the vast majority of hosting and more importantly, fail to acknowledge the history of colonial exploitation and state boundary drawing that were instrumental in creating rampant displacement. Now, what I have outlined here today is the disconnect that currently exists between subcontinental displacements and the Eurocentric approach uh, of the refugee migrant labels. Now, a critical reimagination of these labels is imperative if we are truly invested in an inclusive regime of protection for persons of concerns worldwide. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Jay, for that uh, uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Um, I have a bunch of uh, questions, uh, but I don't want to uh, accuse my prerogative as, uh, as chair. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, to see if uh, anyone else has any questions, and if not, um, I will uh, ask uh, some. So uh, does anyone in the audience um, have any questions? Uh, you can either use the raise hand function, or if you prefer, you can ask your question uh, in uh, the chat. And Nergis. I need to un unmute myself. Thank you very much, Jay. This, this was a pleasure to listen to. Um, I have a question concerning contexts that are post-colonial, post-imperial, but not in the subcontinent. Um, and then also the complexities of 
partitions that come after the partition and um, whether the, the same kind of dynamics play themselves out, um, you know, post-India-Pakistan partition, um, <clears throat> whether the, the categories that, that you mentioned um, actually determine the discourse um, in the, in, during the post-independence period. And then lastly, I have a question uh, concerning um, the moves um, that have been that have been normalized in terms of force displacements leading to um, a continuous fueling of uh, precarious labor regimes elsewhere. And therefore, I, I'm, I'm just going to be very blunt. I feel that <clears throat> um, as much as I admire the idealism of um, the, the compact-like language, um, the vested interests of uh, states and certain sectors of the society um, benefit from these ambiguities on a continual form. Sean, should I take a couple more questions or should I just answer this? Um, why don't you start by answering? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Nargis, for that question. Really appreciate it. Uh, in terms of what happened after the partition of India, of course, um, over the last five or six decades, uh, India has had to quickly respond to uh, displacements from uh, from Tibet, uh, from Bangladesh, as a result of the liberation war in the 70s, uh, of course, in the 80s with the Sri Lanka displacement. So I have done a very detailed analysis of all of this uh, in my doctoral work. But what I found through the, uh, the archival research I did, and also uh, some of the practice related elements that I found, was that India was quite dynamic in its approach, in the sense that it did not have a set uh, definition of a refugee, which meant that India was able to quickly adapt uh, to some of these situations that were emerging in its neighborhood. So when the Tibetans arrived in India, uh, it was more done initially with a sense of kinship in mind. Uh, and then it became more of a way to show itself as a, uh, as a leader with respect to refugee policy, though it had not ratified or signed the 1951 convention at the time. And of course, you know, um, there were progressive elements that were also um, created as a result of some of these uh, displacements. Uh, there were a lot of debates that were conducted in uh, the parliament. But what we see today is a very stark difference, which is what I was saying uh, in my presentation, that what we see today in terms of refugee policy, or at least the generosity with which India used to accept refugees has changed quite a bit. Um, and you know, a lot of commentators have also said that there is a lack of nuance with respect to what India does with respect to refugee protection practice. But that is not to say that, you know, um, there's been some kind of response, at least temporary protection. Uh, and in the case of Tibetans, permanent protection, because a lot of them have been able to apply for citizenship and live there. And uh, what I also wanted to connect uh, with this point is that even before the partition of India, um, India was actually hosting several European refugees. There was a, um, a body of work that talks about Polish refugees in India uh, through the 30s and the 40s. So under the auspices of the League of Nations, and of course, while the British were still in India, um, applying some very oppressive colonial policies, uh, India was still able to provide sanctuary to a lot of, lot of refugees who were fleeing, uh, you know, fleeing the Second World War related um, uh, atrocities. So I think there has been some kind of a pattern with respect to generosity. And what I feel more disappointed about right now is the fact that that tone has changed in the last few years, which is not very reflective of, of what used to happen before. And to your point about how the GCR tends to benefit states, I agree with you. And with respect to post-colonial labor migrations, I, I also position myself as one of those people who has arrived as an immigrant, but I have a fair bit of social capital that has enabled me to um, operate slightly better in these contexts. But a lot of South Asian uh, individuals tend to um, be in very precarious situations, especially in the Middle East. And this is yet another element that I haven't explored enough about, but there is definitely something there. So I haven't done enough work on that, so I can't talk about it a lot, 
but that is something that I can keep in mind. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks. Uh, Nilofar. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for your presentation. I wanted to say that, in fact, on generosity uh, in Iranian history, there have been periods where quite a number of our progressive uh, intellectuals actually fled to India. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I also know that intellectual and activist Afghans uh, fled to India. So mm -hmm. I think that point you made is quite interesting. But the question I wanted to pose is how you juxtapose what you mentioned uh, with the policies and treatment by India and Modi's government recently uh. of the, mos uh, the yeah. Muslims from the three neighboring countries mm -hmm who mm. have been born and several generations in India, but are mm. seen as quote unquote undocumented and mm -hmm. are at risk of being denied their nationality and being mm. deported. Mm -hmm. I want Thank to you. your thoughts on that as well. Sure, James. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Lofar. I really appreciate that question. Um, you know, the, the kind of things that I witness um, is just very shocking um, to say the least. Um, of course, there has been a very steady um, application of a certain uh, religious uh, attachment to the territory. So I think India has gone above and beyond to engage in historical revisionism and in certain cases, historical negationism, I would say, whereby they erase history entirely to provide a new version um, to show that India had always been uh, a haven for Hindus and it's a Hindu nation, which is never the case. The founding documents do not say that India is a Hindu nation, it's a secular nation, right? So there is a very deliberate attempt to change the course of history at this point, which is what I would say. Um, and something like this, for instance, you know, you talk about intellectuals fleeing to India uh, to seek refuge, but intellectuals are very high risk in India at this point. Um, I think a couple of weeks ago, there was a workshop on this very element about academic freedom uh, in India and how you know, Indian academics are now a threat. So once again, you know, it's about, we are very, very quickly descending into a very authoritarian state whereby um, being Indian is associated with being of a certain religious group. Um, and anyone who does not belong in that group is considered to be an outsider. So there has been a very clear um, othering that's been going on for the last seven to eight years, I would say. Um, but it is very shocking. And you know, I try to speak to a lot of my friends in the diaspora about this. And we try to bring about these points and see if there can be something constructive. But at this point, it just seems that it's so fast and it moves so fast that we are quite hamstrung by what we can do um, sitting here. Thank you, Nilofar. Appreciate that question. Are there uh, other questions? Again, you can uh, raise your hand or you can uh, put them in the chat. And maybe while we uh, wait for that, um, uh, Jay, maybe I'll ask you uh, a question. Mm -hmm. I was interested um, when you were um, uh, in, the, in the PowerPoint, you uh, referred to uh, a case uh, and uh, had indicated an illegal uh, migrant in uh, in quotes. Um, and I maybe mean, wonder um, what you see as the role of uh, legality and illegality in the uh, in the dichotomy uh, that you're uh, that you're interested in, and how that might be similar or different uh, from uh, legality and illegality as it plays out in similar kinds of debates uh, in Canada and elsewhere? Uh, thank you. Um, I think the, the case, the final decision on the case actually was released a little under a year ago in April, 2021, whereby the Supreme Court uh, upheld the decision to deport um, Rohingya refugees. And of course, you know, that has been a very steady process. This is actually, quite an interesting element uh, to consider because there have been instances in the past where the Supreme Court has been very favorable in its 
um, decision towards asylum seekers and refugees. Though India had not uh, signed on to the convention, um, courts have been very deliberate in extending constitutional protections to asylum seekers and refugees, whereby in certain cases they had ordered individuals who were detained by Indian authorities to actually release them and actually approach UNHCR to seek asylum there. So there is definitely a liminal space now between legality and illegality that has been created through these pronouncements and uh, decisions uh, by judicial institutions. But I think it's not very clear cut because as I mentioned um, just earlier to Nilafar's question, there is a very steady and very deliberate effort in making certain people or characterizing certain people as illegal, um, though they have you know, a lot of attachment to the territory. So by creating this dichotomy, they are widening the space and dividing the population uh, on ethno-religious lines. And that is something uh, that is reflected in refugee protection practice. What is happening right now is that the UNHCR in India is working uh, in a silo practically. It doesn't have a lot of um, interactions with, uh, with the government. As opposed to what we see in Canada, um, I haven't thought about that as much though, Sean, to be honest with you. I haven't thought about the, the difference in how perhaps context like Canada would define legal and illegal versus how India does it. Um, I don't think there was ever a time that I can think of where law was used as a, uh, as a way to decide whether or not individuals could be, you know, uh, provided asylum or sanctuary in India. It was a more of a policy prescription or based entirely on practice. And this is what I also argue in my doctoral work, whereby I say that law does not actually create any kind of precedence with respect to refugee protection practice in India. It has always been um, ad hoc. It has always been based on specific policies or it has been based on kinship relations or the fact that they have a responsibility to the international community to show that they are able to do enough for refugees. So that is something I can think about a little bit more for sure. Um, but I do appreciate that question. This is very interesting though. I never thought about it, so thank you. I'm okay, I know we've got a couple of questions here, so um, maybe you can address one from the chat. So Monica writes, could you right. please explain if there's are discrepancies between the definition of a refugee in international conventions uh, posed, as opposed to uh, country-specific definitions? Mm. I'm guessing um, Monica's question concerns specifically uh, with respect to the Indian subcontinent. Um, there is definitely no clarity in terms of how India defines refugee. Um, I can say for a fact that, um, as I mentioned before, India's refugee protection practice has been very much based on what it has to do with respect to sudden movements that are happening in its neighborhood. So. India hasn't been very clear on um, who is a refugee. So there are no country, country specific uh, definitions, I would say for a refugee. But of course, you know, I can say that in terms of practice, there is a, a, a very stark difference um, because if we were to base practice entirely on the refugee definition as per the 1951 convention, I think it would be very specific um, in terms of race, religion, nationality, membership of a social group and political opinion. But India has not had those limitations, which is why it said that it feels a bit, um, you know, it feels that there is some level of freedom in deciding um, who it considers as a refugee. It's not constrained by some of these notions of who is a refugee. So that is what India has been doing, which is why it has still been very resistant in signing on to the convention. Of course, as I mentioned, more contemporary implications are very different, but historically I can say for a fact that India did not define who a refugee is. It has just been based entirely on practice and less on definitions. Uh, thanks, okay. Um, why don't we go uh, the next? I'm not sure you, you 
Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Here, yeah. Jun Pyo. Jun Pyo Kim. I am Jun Pyo Kim. Excuse me. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. My English is very poor. Uh, there is a case of example. Uh, a man has come to Jeju Island uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, he argue uh, he is a refugee. Uh, so uh, accept him as a refugee. But uh, Korean government uh, think uh, he is, he would be, he may be uh, illegal migrant. <laughs> uh, what can I do for him? Mm. I, I don't know if I have an answer to that, to be honest, Ajahn. I mean, it's a very good question. This is entirely the reason why the labels are extremely problematic when we say that somebody is a refugee and somebody is a, a migrant or an illegal immigrant in this particular case. It creates hierarchy in terms of who's more deserving of protection and who's not. And I think it's also based entirely on state policy as to what it does. So I can't speak to Korean uh, refugee policy for sure, um, but I can say that this is very problematic. Um, and it's, it's just very unfortunate that somebody who was initially accepted as a refugee is now being considered as, a, as an illegal immigrant. Um, but states tend to have the discretion to do it, which is why these labels are very problematic. Mm. Uh I think uh, refugee and migrants, uh, 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 the reason um, of re refugee and migrants, uh, the colonial of global capitalism. Uh, so uh, we consider uh, refugee and other all migrants and uh, victims in the nation, uh, welfare or, or against uh, capitalism movement. <laughs> uh, what do you think about it? Makes sense. No, absolutely. I mean, um, of course, you know, as I mentioned, the, these definitions and these labels are, of course, colonial creations. Um, I, I can. I can't speak specifically to some of the questions that you're raising because it's beyond the scope of what I've been looking at. Um, there is definitely a great deal of uh, work that's been done on uh, you know, liberal notions of, um, of the refugee uh, label, but also I think uh, states tend to have more advantage in terms of deciding uh, who is a refugee and who is a migrant. So that is one of the big issues, um, which we really need to try to uh, talk a little bit more about, but yeah. Thank you <laughs> for your rich answer to my poor question. No, thank you. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, yeah. your, thanks for your question. Um, so uh, next we'll go to uh, Ngozi. Hello. Hi. That, that, yeah, that was good presentation, Ray. Uh, if I can, if you don't mind. Um, mine is, um, is there anything the states, like the Manipur, the Mizoram, Nagaland, uh, and the uh, Assam state, is there anything they can do, you know, outside the, the decision or the policy of the central government mm. to help the migrants and the refugees? Because um, I know that uh, sometimes communities can come together if, if, that communities that are divided by the border, international border, they can come together to make things easier for each other. Like here in Africa, what you have too. Some communities, they come together to solve their problems and uh, make things easier for people from the other side of the border. So is there anything the, the states can do or even political parties, the opposition political parties, is there anything they can do? Thank you, Ray. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that question. Uh, interestingly, there have been some judicial institutions within these states that have um, said that what the Supreme Court has done in particular case of the Rohingya is quite bad because um, in one other case that came up more recently, I think it was around May 2021, 
in uh, one of the high courts in, in the northeastern states. I think I want to say it is Manipur, but I, I, I need to check. Um, they were very clear about saying that, you know, the Constitution of India does provide people uh, who are asylum seekers and refugees uh, the same kind of rights as citizens do possess. So there are some progressive judicial institutions or jurists who have actually done very different things and they don't follow along the same lines of what the Supreme Court does. Um, but as a state policy, um, it is very difficult to say what they are able to do because they are very much um, still bound by a lot of these policies that are made uh, by the central government. Not to the last detail, but in certain cases, I'm sure there are individuals who do not believe that what the central government does with respect to refugees is, is right because they are the ones who share the border with a lot of these states and they should be able to have a little more say. But unfortunately, that's not how things work. Um, it's, there are only a handful of jurists who are able to say, well, you know, there can be more progressive interpretations of this and they are actually trying to do that. Um, but we need to see more of that. So that's my very quick answer to your question. There's no specific policy that they can do or draft, uh, because they are bound by, um, a lot of what the central government does. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got a, a question um, or a comment in the chat uh, from uh, Rashin, um, who uh, suggests, uh, who wonders whether uh, in Southeast Asia, more broadly, the definition of uh, a refugee is based on assumptions and uh, changing um, uh, circumstances related to perceptions of kind of deservingness of uh, protection. Mm -hmm as opposed to um, more kind of international uh, agreements that would define uh, refugees, pointing specifically to the example of, uh, of Malaysia as a non-signatory to the convention right. protocol. Mm. Um, I don't know if I can speak specifically to Southeast Asia, Russian, but um, the way I arrived at some of the answers to the questions that I had was uh, to explore more um, about the fact that I mean, there, there's obviously a lot of, there's a cacophony of definitions that exists um, as to who a refugee is, and there's nothing specific about that. Um, so if I were to think from the perspective of what South Asia has done over the last few years, um, I can say for a fact that a lot of these refugee movements have been the result of some kind of Western influence or colonial uh, influence, purely because of the forced um, uh, border creation. And those are very arbitrary in nature. Um, but the deservingness is something that I haven't really uh, been very clear about because India has been very ambiguous in its policy. So when, I, when you talk about deservingness, I think it's very interesting that you raise that question. It has treated certain groups of refugees differently as opposed to certain others. So for instance, with Tibetan refugees, uh, India provided permanent sanctuary. They were allowed to have a government in exile and they were also you know, provided pathways to citizenship. But on the other hand, with Sri Lankan refugees, Sri Lankan Tamil refugees who had arrived in, the, in India since the 1980s, there has been a steady process of repatriation, right? A lot of them had never been or lived in Sri Lanka because they were born in India in the refugee camps, but they are still being asked to leave India and return to Sri Lanka. So um, there is some kind of a strategic ambiguity, I would say, with respect to what India does, and this is what even Chimney talks about. So perhaps um, looking at how, in your case, Malaysia, treats different groups of refugees might be an interesting um, pathway for you to be able to explore a little bit. Um, but, you know, the deservingness argument is not something that I have explored a lot of, but I have talked about ambiguity in how certain groups of refugees are treated differently because India's policy has changed over a period of time and it has responded to some of the political disturbances that have also happened domestically. So, that can sometimes determine 
uh, who is more deserving of protection versus who is not. Um, okay, and maybe um, maybe I'll ask one uh, last uh, question, which is uh, that at the end of your uh, presentation, um, which I thought made a really compelling uh, pitch for uh, why um, the uh, uh, the refugee migrant uh, dichotomy, uh, which plays out in this kind of unique configuration in this context, why it's continuing to uh, cause um, uh, problems and, and challenges, and you. I suggested that uh, there was a need for um, a critical and, and creative um, thinking about uh, uh, some alternatives. Uh, so I'm curious if you had any tentative uh, kind of thoughts about uh, what that uh, uh, what that might uh, look like, or yeah. where we might uh, uh, go next. That's an excellent question. Honestly, I think the only way I can think of an alternative is to perhaps radically change the way we think about displacement. And more specifically, um, if we were to include some of the um, colonial and post-colonial subjectivities uh, within our understanding of displacement, that could provide us with a slightly better uh, view of, um, of specific contexts. And my concern is also that even when subcontinental um, displacements were happening. Uh, states were trying to, um, you know, trying to push back on some of the external influences that came with, um, uh, you know, many international organizations like Save the Children or um, UNICEF and so many other organizations sort of coming in and saying, well, you're not treating refugees properly because we know better. That kind of hegemony, there needs to be a break in that. Um, and I think the third element would be for states in the West or the global North to actually look at themselves and think about their hypocrisy, uh, the fact that they have been so exclusionary in their own approach um, to refugee acceptance and how they have been placing more constraints uh, on refugee arrivals. Um, especially those who arrive from the Mediterranean into Italy and Spain. So when I think those kinds of elements can slowly start creating a much deeper engagement with the transnational nature of displacement, but also to integrate clearly why these displacements are happening in the first place. The fact that a lot of these states are refugee producing states a tag that I absolutely do not like is purely because of the instabilities that were created as a result of historical colonial invasion. And as long as we don't recognize that, I don't think we will ever get to a point where we can harmonize this idea that there is a radically different conceptualization of displacement in other parts of the world and that there is not just a universal conceptualization. So the only way I can think of is to restructure the way we have been viewing displacement um, and a radically progressive instrument that can actually truly reflect uh, some of these uh, deficiencies. That's the only way I can think of. So, uh, a more radical, uh, more inclusive, um, uh, less colonial. Yes approach to, uh, to refugee studies, I think is a wonderful way to end a uh, CRS uh, seminar. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, thank you, Jay, for uh, your presentation today, for the interesting uh, discussion. I uh, wanted to thank also everyone for their, uh, for their questions uh, and uh, comments. And I did uh, want to say just one more time um, that we're delighted uh, that you've uh, joined the CRS community uh, and uh, the uh, York community, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, more engagement and hopefully in-person engagement uh, in Perfect. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the Bye. questions. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.